So now, without further delay, I'm introducing our speaker today, Felix Mösbauer. Felix studied computer science at LMU from 2012 on and finished in 2019 with a master's degree. His main interests are in high performance and distributed computing. He has one of the core developers. He was one of the core developers of the Dash C++ library. For his master's thesis, he moved to Siemens CT and implemented the data race detection tool, which is called DRace, which focuses on modularity and extendability. Currently, he works as a software engineer at the multi-core expert center at Siemens, where he improves DRace and optimizes low latency and real-time communication. So Felix, welcome to MOOC++ and thanks a lot for volunteering to give this talk. Yeah, thanks Klaus for the, the warm welcome. So at first I want to thank you all, all the organizers for this opportunity to give a talk in the MAC++ group. That's really a pleasure for me. And then for the audience, uh, I have to tell you, unfortunately, that you will not see too much C++ code here. Um, as we mostly operate uh, on the lower layers, uh, I would say. So maybe assembly, uh, uh, more on what the CPU does. But uh, I want to, I, I will try to keep things simple and um, also uh, make it easy for beginners to, to get into the topic and um, to understand everything. So if something might be unclear during the talk, um, as Klaus already mentioned, just write a comment in the chat and then I can try to clarify things. And finally, I hope um, that the talk will bring some light into the mystic world of uh, code analysis tooling. So at first, uh, let's start with um, my background. I think I can skip that as Klaus already introduced that. But um, one thing I want to highlight here is that I'm an open source in enthusiast. So I really like to um, like the culture behind open source and um, like to work on open source projects. And also here in, in my, my group at Siemens, we contribute to lots of open source projects, just to name some of them I worked on here, here on the slide. And as I often get the question, um, when I, maybe a C++ beginner asked me how to get into the topic, and I, that's, uh, I always say, have a look into large open source projects, skim through the issues, uh, see how they do it, and then try to try to solve it by your own, or try just to understand how things were solved there, and that that really helps to get into the topic. Okay, so um, just some further organizational aspects. Um, the talk is structured into the following sections. So first we start with the introduction. Then I give you a theoretical background on the topic. Um, then we have an overview uh, over the uh, DRACE tool. And also I, I will give a live demo on the DRACE tool. Um, then we uh, have a look at performance tuning, and finally uh, we conclude and and then have some time for discussion and maybe also uh, in the uh, in the after um, talk. And uh, whenever you see this the slide with this large question uh, label on it, then um, uh, I will stop for for a couple of seconds and um, uh, have a look what what questions are there, and then I can try to answer them. So let's start with the basics. Um, why do we all? Why do we take all the effort uh, of this uh, instrumentation, um, and what is what's it useful for? So first, uh, one use case is to detect data races. Let's uh, start with the definition of a data race, or what is a data race? It's whenever two accesses um, happen to the same memory location without synchronization, and at least one of these accesses is um, a write access. So if I just have two reads to the same memory location, uh, it's not a data race. But if I have at least one write, um, then it's a data race. And that's a correctness issue, of course. Uh, unfortunately, it's really, really hard to find. And even with testing approaches or debugging, it's almost impossible to, to, to find these data races. And they led to sporadic failures. Um, and often these sporadic failures only appear in non-debug builds uh, in production or after a long time. And uh, as it's hard to, to debug, it really takes time to, to dig down into the, the reason for, for the bug. So, uh, one use case here is to detect these uh, data races. So let's start with a simple example. 
um, consider this C++ code where we uh, do nothing else than just incrementing a value. And the value is, uh, is stored in a memory address. So or that's, that, that's the whole code. And um, as I get often the question, uh, or people don't trust me that this is actual code. Uh, if you <laughs> don't trust me, then just cl uh, click on this link. That's exactly this example on, on Godbolt. So here we have our main method. We declare a variable. In this case, it's on the stack, but that doesn't really matter. And then uh, we have two threads here. Um, we just start a new thread, which um, calls the increment method with the pointer to this variable here. And we do the same in the um, in the main thread. Then we wait until both threads are joined again and we return the result. And what you would expect here is as we increment two times, at least I would expect that the outcome or the, the return value is always two. Then have a look at the generated assembly. Here we have our increment method and we just add one to the, um, uh, to the memory location uh, from the RDI register. So, uh, and, and then we return from the function and that's it. And now if we uh, look how some load store assembler could look like or um, how the CPU could um, process this, <clears throat> is that we have here our two threads, one on the left and one on the right. And then the first, uh, the first uh, thread loads the data into the cache or a register. Here you see, um, yeah, here, here you can't really see it, but uh, loaded into a register. Um, then the second thread does that, and both of them, of course, load zero because it's initialized with zero. And then the first one locally adds a one, the second one locally adds a one, then the first one stores the one, and then the second one stores the one. So what do we have here? We have a read-write dependency. And for, for the people who are um, more into databases, um, exactly this case is known as a lost, lost update because we updated two times, but we it seems like we just updated only one time. How could we fix that? Well, that's uh, not, not too hard, but you have to do it <clears throat> by using Atomics. Here we just declare a C++11 um, standard Atomic, um, initialize it with, with a zero, and then we do exactly the same. But here, instead of passing a pointer to the um, very true to the integer, we pass a pointer to the standard atomic int. And apart from that, everything remains, remains the same. And if you look at the assembly that's generated, it's now looking a bit differently because uh, here you see we have this lock prefix. And that ensures that during this operation here, the CPU bus is locked. So we just get. Um, uh, these three instructions in an atomic block. So here we still have two possible schedules because it's not um, defined uh, if, if the T1 first does this or the T2 first does this. But uh, in, in, in any case, um, the, the schedule here is not interleaved. So we always have an atomic load at store. And then the second one also load at store. And by that here, the second one always loads the one. And um, by that, the result is correct. And that's it, that's a data race. And <laughs> the only thing uh, we want to do uh, or what we want to target in, in the rest of the talk is how can we automatically detect these cases in a, in a real world application? <laughs> okay, and here we have the first question slide. Are there already questions? So there's no questions yet. Um, please continue. Okay, very good. Um, so first start with the a theoretical background. How can we detect data races? Um, there are two main categories of algorithms and um, they are also not, not really new. Um, and, and maybe the oldest one is the Lockset algorithm. And by that, we just consider which locks or you can also think of muti mutices, which mutexes are acquired while a memory location is accessed. So maybe an example helps here. <clears throat> here we have our first thread. 
which locks the mutex M1 or acquires the, the mutex M1. Then it acquires the mutex M2. And then it ex uh, accesses the variable X or the, the memory allocation of, of X, whatever. So here, for this access, we can calculate the lock set. And the lock set is just the set of all locks that are acquired while this, uh, this um, memory access happens. <clears throat> so here in this case, we locked mutex one and mutex two. So we add mutex one and two to the lock set. Then we unlock uh, the mutex two and access Y. And here, uh, dur during this access, only the lock M1 is, uh, is in the lock set because we unlocked the, the M2. And then we have a, a second thread which locks M3 and M2. So here um, in this lock set, we would have M2, uh, M3 and M2, of course, because we acquired them. <clears throat> and now we intersect these, the, this lock set with the already existing lock set for the variable Y. So here we had the lock set M, M1. Here we have, as you see, M3, M2, and we just calculate the intersection and the intersection is empty. So uh, we can have the case that um, this variable is, exec uh, is accessed simultaneously because um, the lock set is empty, so um, it's, it cannot be ensured that this is always uh, accessed under the same lock. Uh, here, that's the same for the variable X. Here we have M3 and M2 in, in our lock set for this access, and we uh, intersect it with the, the lock set we had here, with, which is M1 and M2. And by that, we have M2 in the lock set, and it's not empty. So What's the difference here? Here, if the lock set is empty, a data race uh, could occur. So that's a, a case uh, which we should report to the user if we want to do data race detection. Here, um, this variable X is always um, accessed at least uh, under the lock of M2. So here we don't have a data race. <clears throat> and here on the left, you see the, 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 the definition of the algorithm, but I hope uh, my example makes it, uh, yeah, makes it clear how, how it works here. Then move on to the next algorithm. That's the happened before algorithm, which is based on Lamport's happened before relation. And this relation says two element, elements A and B are in the happened before relation um, if and exactly if the following conditions are met. First, uh, if they, the events happen on the same process, then A is A and B are in the relation if the time, which can be a logical time of A, is smaller than the time um, of B. So that's, uh, that's a trivial order, which just says first A happens, then B happens. And second, if they are not on the same process, if A sends a message to B, then also A and B are in this relation. So here uh, was uh, consider this example with, with uh, three threads. Here S1 just denotes uh, a segment um, that's just a, a bunch of, of memory accesses. You can also think of just in one variable. Uh, here we have our segment S1. S1 and S4 are of course in the relation because, well, they, they are on the th same thread and they happen one after another. And um, then S1 and S5, for instance, are also in the relation because here we have this arc. So um, we have a signal from um, thread one to thread two. And this signal could also be um, here a mutex release and here a mutex acquire. That would also construct this happened before arc. Um, so S1 and S5 are in the relation. Uh, also, the relation is transitive. You can easily check that by your own. Um, so also S1 and S7, for, for instance, are in the relation. But S4 and S2 are not in the relation because there's no arc in between. So there's no, no message sent from um, uh, in this direction here. So that's, uh, that's why they are not, not in the relation. And now the only goal 
to do data race detection is to find pairs of accesses to the same variable, which are not in the happened before relation. And then these are potential data races and we want to report them to the users. And that's all theory behind data race detection. <laughs> we just have uh, the, the um, eraser based algorithms, then we have the happened before based algorithms, um, which just analyze all the accesses and the, the signals or logs. And um, then there are some hybrid uh, algorithms which just combine these two techniques, but that's mainly for, for performance reasons. So um, the next <clears throat> theoretical section that's a bit longer is how do we get this information so we need information about memory accesses so which memory addresses are um, accessed and we need information about calls and calls can be calls to synchronization logic for for instance mutex acquire mutex release send us the signal <clears throat> also to be useful we also need some more information like uh, what's the call stack to this uh, memory access and um, uh, we call the process of, of getting all this information just instrumentation. And I think everybody of you, um, even if, if, if you don't have it in mind yet, but you already did instrumentation because this printf debugging, which is shown here on the, on the bottom right, is nothing, nothing else than just instrumenting your code to find, to find the bug. So here in this example, we would want to detect a uh, uh, division by zero and you just put print s everywhere and see uh, how many of these uh, logs, uh, log statements uh, are printed. And if some statement is not printed, then you can be sure that uh, the bug has to be somewhere, uh, some lines above that. And more formal in the context of, of computer programming, Instrumentation refers to the measures, measure of a product's performance, to diagnose errors, and to write trace information. Programmers implement instrumentation in the form of code instructions that monitor specific components in a system. For example, instru uh, instructions uh, may output logging information to appear on the screen, like it's done here. Um, and what are the limitations of, of that? So if you carefully look at the definition, you see with our, this approach, we only have execution coverage. That means we can only collect data uh, in, from program traces or program paths that were actually executed. Even if we instrument all of our software and we do not execute this, then we don't get the, get the information. So we only have execution coverage. And another problem is the runtime overhead because whenever you add, inform add instructions to yeah, monitor your, your code, that are just additional instructions. And these additional instructions change the runtime behavior of the program under test and also um, add a significant overhead. It depends on how much you instrument, but it, uh, it's a significant overhead in most cases. <laughs> So let's uh, uh, deep dive into that. Um, at first, what do we instrument? We want to instrument synchronization events because these are then the arcs between uh, arcs we use for the happened before <coughs> evaluation. Uh, we need information about calls so that we can create call stacks and later on say at this call stack, you access this variable and there the data race happened. Otherwise, uh, if we just say a data race happened on this lo memory location, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that might be right, but uh, what, what can the developer do with this information? And um, that's everything we need. And now how do we instrument? By wrapping calls to synchronization functions and by doing a pre and post, a pre and post uh, call handlers and by doing memory instrumentation. And if you look at the, um, the example in the middle, here you see a uh, trivial uh, ex uh, application which just uh, creates a, or uses a standard mutex. Then the mutex is acquired. Then the function foo is called and um, then the mutex is released. And uh, for, for getting all the information we need, we would have to instrument the program like, look, like it's looking on the, on the right here. So before we acquire the mutex, we add a pre-acquire uh, function which then 
goes into our uh, analysis lo logic and tells them that now this mutex is going to be acquired. Then we have the actual instruction. <clears throat> then we have a post acquire because now the mutex is acquired. Then we instrument that the, the function foo is entered. <clears throat> After the function foo, we tell that the function now is, is um, returned from. Then we have a pre-release of the mutex, then we unlock the mutex, and then we have a post-release. And now um, we have to get that into our code somehow automatically, because um, it's not, not feasible that the developer adds all these instructions here. Um, then let's have a look at some debugging basics. As I said, we are interested in call stacks. So um, what's the difference between a backtrace and a shadow stack. A backtrace is just, or it's just a way um, to construct the the call stack from a given PC. So for just how how I did get there, for instance. So here's an example from from a stack trace in <coughs> a backtrace in a Windybug. So we just break the program at some some point in time, then press K, and by that the the backtrace is. Um, constructed and here we see <clears throat> all the functions that were call, called um, up to this program counter. And another option here is to have a shadow stack. And a shadow stack technically does the same. So again, we get the backtrace, but um, uh, get the call stack. But here we, instead of walking up the stack like we do it here in the debugger, we just and track each call of and, and return uh, of a function. And by that, um, we can we can create exactly the, the call stack that the application also um, used. And the, pro, the, the difference here is <clears throat> that for a backtrace, I do not have a constant overhead per call. And it's precise because here, um, the overhead only happens when I want to get the call stack. So, um, if I only need some call stacks, so long times between between the, the, the call stacks, <clears throat> um, that's that's cheap. But unfortunately, it's very expensive if I have to call this frequently. <clears throat> and that's exactly the opposite for the shadow stack. So that's cheaper um, than a backtrace uh, when I have to call it frequently. But unfortunately, I have a constant overhead per call. And also, it's a bit... Um, it's it's not so precise because I cannot see inline functions, for instance. But here, um, in this example, when we enter the function here, we just push that to the stack. And then when uh, we return from the function, we just pop that from the stack. And also for the data race analysis, as we are interested in the call stack for each memory access, um, of course, we have to use shadow stacks. Um, next, we dive a bit, uh, dive in a bit deeper. So, how does this program look like to the CPU, or how does a program look like uh, to the CPU? Um, so here, that's also um, just a snippet from uh, Windybug from a sample application. Um, so, if, if you're familiar with Assembly x86 Assembly, then you see that here, this is a this int three is a debug trap, <clears throat> and um, here we have the execution order from the top to the bottom, and it's just uh, executed one by another. Here we have the addresses, so that's just the the location where the instruction is loaded into memory. Then we have the instruction itself, so the the opcode for for the instruction, or a better the um, yeah the, the encoding. <clears throat> And here we have a disassembly uh, with the mnemonic and the operands. So for, for instance, here we copy a value from the register to the memory. Uh, here we push a value of a register on the stack. Here um, a call we call a function. Uh, here we jump to a label at an address. And um, here the thing that is, is marked in blue is just the current instruction pointer or program counter. So here we use, say, instruction pointer and um, program counter as an alias. So it's both are the same. And now, <clears throat> as we now have the basic knowledge about uh, how the program looks like, uh, we can start instrumenting it. And for that, we have 
<clears throat> multiple options and I just want to go briefly through the options we have here. So um, one option is to instrument at compile time. Uh, one familiar tool or flag for that is, um, uh, is that the, what the thread sanitizer um, does or keys on. So that uses the compiler to add the instrumentation. And you can just do that. You can also try it in, in Godball uh, by adding the minus F sanitize equals thread flag. And that then just adds some functions like here, um, uh, we hear uh, this tsun func enter is added by the compiler and just uh, tells that there's a function uh, to be entered. Here, a tsun read um, refers to that uh, a read access should be locked, tsun write that a write access should be locked, and tsun func exit just that we return from a function. And um, even uh, and then the compiler just takes care of adding this um, these instrumentation, and then at runtime we have to make sure that uh, we separate the the detector um, logic from from what the application does by just putting that into different memory regions. But as the compiler also um, can encode that, that's relatively easy. So an, an advantage here is that. We only have to, for data race detection, we only have to instrument the code where, where we cannot prove that it's race free. And another advantage is that we can use the optimizer because here the compiler knows about the program code so it can also optimize it. But a huge disadvantage in pra practice is that all libraries have to be compiled with this instrumentation as well, because otherwise we jo just don't get the memory accesses that ha that happen uh, in libraries which are not instrumented. And uh, we need compiler support for, for that. And if we have to use a compiler like MSVC, for instance, which has no support for that, um, yeah, that we have no chance to, to um, follow this approach. Also, um, if you're interested, um, this is the link to the example on Godboard. Um, then another option would be to use um, to add the instrumentation at runtime by using emulation. And with emulation, I just mean um, that you have some form of uh, emulator or interpreter, which just takes one instruction at a time, looks at it, and based on the instruction, it calls into your analysis logic or does some stuff. And one famous emulator is um, QEMU, for, for instance, those that's a, a virtual machine or can somehow a virtual machine. Um, you can use that to also uh, execute code, which is written for, for ARM targets on an x86 system and do things like that because it does not execute the, the code on the CPU, but it just interprets the code and does a, something similar on the CPU. And that can be used to analyze also um, software that is written for different architectures, as I said um, already. And an advantage here is we have no time distortion because uh, as we simulate everything in the program, uh, we also have just some kind of logical time and we can also simulate the time. Then we can do the analysis of a whole system. For for instance, that may, might be required if we want to analyze a software for a microcontroller. But the problem here is that it's really compl complex to set up and um, you, you have to find the needle in the haystack because um, with the emulator, you just emulate everything and you have to get the information you need out of all these instructions because on the emulation layer you level uh, you just see uh, each instruction but cannot really take advantage of debug information or things like that so it's by that it's hard to map um, the instruction and the address of the instruction back to um, back to our source code so it's it's hard to do the the uh, the pass from um, the detected data arrays to to a symbolized call stack um, how you got there to this data arrays and then the third option is to do it at runtime, but dynamically. And that means we disassemble fractions of the program at runtime. <clears throat> then we add the instrumentation to these fractions of code. And then we recompile everything to the heap. Why to the heap? Yeah, well, because we, we, we cannot recompile it to the same memory location as it's now 
the, the the block is larger because we have more instructions in it. So instead of overwriting um, the instructions, we just compile it to the heap. Then we change the program counter and execute it from the heap natively. Um, and this part on the heap is also, in, in here we also call that a code cache. So here, um, that's an example of how your memory could look like. Here we have the high memory address with the low memory address. Here we have some process environment block, uh, the threat environment block. Then we have uh, the dyna uh, dynamic link libraries or shared objects. Um, then we have our actual program image where the, the initial program counter points to. Then we have the heap. And below that, we have the stack. The heap grows from low memory, from the low address um, to the high address, and the stack grows vice versa. Um, and, and that's how it is going to be executed. So here we have our instruction pointer, and now we just um, yeah, execute from there. I, I, technically, the instruction pointer should point to the bottom of the program image, but uh, yeah. It, you 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 know what 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 I mean here, and um, if we instrument it like that, or we, if we use runtime instrumentation, then here we have uh, the, the same things, and along with the dynamic link libraries, we also have a library for our instrumentation framework and for the analysis client. So that's the client which we use to analyze all the accesses we get from the. Um, from the instrumentation. Then we have our program image, and then we have the code cache, which is on the heap. And we just point the instruction pointer to the code cache and natively execute from there. <clears throat> so an advantage of that is that we have a precise control over what to instrument. Because here we can use uh, debug information, for instance, to just instrument some functions uh, we are interested in. Another advantage is that it also works with self-modifying codes, and we don't uh, have to know in, ad in advance which DLLs uh, are going to be loaded by the uh, executable, because um, that doesn't matter. Whenever we see a block that is marked as executable, uh, then, then we just instrument the, the, uh, this block and put it on the in the heap in the code cache, and then we execute from there. So it works with self-modifying codes as well, and by that it also works with jitted codes like you have uh, with C sharp, for instance, or .NET. And you have a very very low overhead compared to the emulation because you execute it natively on the CPU. You don't emulate the instructions, but you just disassemble them at your instrumentation, reassemble them on the code cache, and then execute it from there natively. But uh, with all advantages, there are also disadvantages. Um, that's as both the instrumentation logic and our analysis, analysis logic um, run in the same process. So here, the, uh, the blue things are in the same process uh, as the, the green things. <clears throat> A careful separation between um, both parts is necessary because the application we, we must not disturb the applic the application otherwise it, it will likely crash um, and that is something we call transparency issues so whenever we change the application in a way that it notifies um, or it it, that it is not no longer in the state that it expects it's very likely that the application crashes okay so um, as we now learned how to instrument, uh, we can try to tackle the initial task to get information about um, the read and written memory addresses. And as I said here, we instrument mesh code. So first we have to get the operands of a memory changing instruction. And then next we have to write the, uh, these operands into a memory buffer so we can later analyze this buffer. As of course we cannot just call here the, the, uh, into the instrumentation logic, um, because calling also requires preparation, uh, like saving saving the stack and, and things like that. So um, we just add instructions that write the memory into a buffer. And then um, later on, we are able to an analyze the buffer. And here is an example of, of how uh, our assembly could look like. So here we have a compare. Then a, a jump equal, a move, um, that's an instruction we are interested in because it um, reads or writes a memory at an address. 
then an addition, an end, and a jump. And now we want to add instructions between this jump equal and the, the move here. So um, what we first do is that we disassemble this block here into a linked list. Then we add our instructions that can be one or more to um, the beginning of the list. So directly um, next to the move instruction. And with this, this instruction here, we already encoded um, the operands uh, of the move instruction so that we can track them. And then we re-encode that. And here it's important that when re-encoding things, jump distances might change. As here we jumped uh, three blocks uh, or three instructions, and here we now jump four instructions. So we have to re-encode that and recalculate all the um, jump distances here. And um, th theoretically, uh, that's it. So now we are able to uh, to um, trace the smooth uh, instruction and to get this uh, <clears throat> the operands. And uh, by that, we have everything we need for our data race detection. Okay, so how can we do that? There are two options. One is a linear approach. So first we get the whole code or binary, then um, we instrument the binary, uh, then we get into somehow a new binary uh, with all our instrumentation, then we execute it, and then we do an analysis of the recorded events. So here in the, uh, the first arrow just um, denotes the task of AST parsing or binary parsing. Then you can do static code analysis and search for, for the function calls and for the memory accesses. Then you add the instrumentation. So as I said, add calls before each call and before uh, add uh, some inline instrumentation before each memory access. From here to here, you recompile or reassemble it and then uh, execute the instrumented binary. Um, here you have to have to ensure that the debug information of the or original code remains valid because Later on, you need this debug information to symbolize your call stacks. So to get back from addresses to a line in the source code. And then finally, in the last step, you collect and analyze um, the re uh, recorded data and create reports. And um, a class of tools which does this is uh, our profiling tools, um, where you just let the compiler do that and um, then you execute the instrumented binary and then you get uh, the recorded events and then they are just uh, gathered and somehow um, presented in a nice way. And another approach is to do that iterati iteratively. And by that, I mean to just do all these steps in a loop. So we start with the original binary and then we have a code fragment or a basic block. So that's just um, a bunch of, uh, it's just a sequence of instructions um, uh, without control transfer instructions in between. Then this tiny fragment is instrumented, then this fragment is executed, we do the analysis online, and then we move on to the next fragment. And here a huge advantage is that we only have to instrument the fragments that are actually going to be executed. And also, um, as here, this is a loop, um, we can change our instrumentation we apply here based on the analysis results. So for instance, if we uh, know that the executed block here uh, is not interesting anymore because we executed it a million times and there did not happen a data race, then we can just remove the instrumentation from the block and by that avoid overhead. Uh, we can also get partial results online and uh, we can even uh, use an external tool which controls here how it's instrumented. So we can just use a second process with some, some commands so that we can online, while the application is being executed, toggle if it is going to be instrumented or not. Um, so this is also the approach um, we use in the, uh, in the DRACE tool which I will present in the in the next section. And finally, uh, we have to do some post-processing and create some reports which are then uh, useful for, for the developers. And often um, this kind of stuff is, is done in sanitizers. So in Dr. Memory, for instance, if, if you know it. So here for the, for the instrumentation, we use the Dynamo Rio instrumentation framework. 
Um, by that, we can do instruction analysis, can inject code, and can do the code manip manipulation. Mm, here, you see that uh, we run an, the binary to execute. So that's the binary under test with uh, this framework. And we attach a client to the framework that's attached here, which just says or tells the framework what to instrument and how to instrument. Because the framework itself doesn't instrument, it, it, um, it calls into the client when a new block is going to be executed, and then the can, client can inspect it, instrument it, and so on, re-encode it, <clears throat> and then the framework takes care of, of the heavy lifting, so of the execution of the program. And here we just uh, attach our client, <clears throat> which um, has a callback in the uh, transform uh, into this transform stage. So that's where we can read uh, code that is going to be executed and transform it. So add our instrumentation, and um, we can also add um, a callbacks uh, during the execution, which are then which then call back into the client, for instance, to do the memory processing. So for processing the buffers um, of uh, accessed memory locations, as I mentioned earlier. And that's a purely uh, event-driven framework. And uh, the hard thing here is that for this step here, we have to instrument the assembly. So we, we have to know how assembly works. And also, we have to write our um, instrumentation in assembly. Uh, here we just have callbacks that can be regular C functions, um, which just call back into the uh, client context, and um, there we can, yeah, we can use it like in, in regular C programs. Okay, I, I think there are a plenty of questions <laughs> because that was really the the tough par part of the talk. So indeed, we do have a couple of questions. Um, first, there was a question about clarification about the happens before relationship. So I, I just read the question. I would assume that the happens before relationship always relates to messages, even in the same process. Is this correct? Um, yes, that's <clears throat> that's you, you can see it uh, like that. So I would say it's correct. But um, as I showed on the uh, in the definition, if they are on the same process then also the time would be somehow a message. So if uh, the, the time of the first, or if first A happens, then B happens, then at least the logical time is incremented by that. And um, so they are also in the in the relation. All right. So I hope this clarifies uh, the question. <clears throat> um, then there was another question. Um, is there a single pass algorithm for jump rewriting? So actually, that's not really important for us because we use the Dynamo Rio framework for doing the heavy lifting there. Um, actually, I cannot I cannot tell if that's that's uh, required. All right. Then we have a question about page eighteen. <coughs> so thanks for adding the page numbers. This indeed makes it easier. Um, so I'm not clear on this. Are you modifying program code in RAM at runtime or just instructions in the CPU cache? So for some reason, I do not hear you anymore. Did you? OK, do you hear me now? Yes, now it's good. OK. <laughs> That's good, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, redo that, <laughs> what I said. Yeah. Um, so we don't really modify the program code. So the program image remains exactly the same as it, it would look like if we don't do the instrumentation stuff. Mm -hmm. The only thing we do is read the program image into our cache, um, add, our instrument add our instrumentation, and then write this block to the heap. Then we change the program counter to point to this new block on the heap and then execute from there. And um, of course, as we do that in tiny blocks, uh, we, mo most we almost only operate in the CPU cache, um, but that's tra transparent for us. So we operate on, on memory addresses here. OK, thank you. And then there's a, a final question for slide 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, so, how does the runtime instrumentation work with multi-threaded programs? 
Yes, <laughs> that's a tricky question. Um, I would just refer you to the uh, either to the Dynamo Rio documentation because there this is discussed in detail. Um, well, so um, technically you just do it for uh, you have you have to introduce some locks because you have to keep a consistent state, um, but. The, the framework tries to minimize the the locked state to to really really a minimal, and there are two options you can do. One is to have a shared code cache. That means all threads have a shared um, uh, yeah truth. I would say so a shared view on the memory. Mm -hmm. And another option is to have dedicated code caches for each thread. Um, that's a bit a problem if you have many many threads because then you have some code blow up. Um, but our space blow up, but um, that has the advantage that you uh, need a way um, less locking, and also you can instrument differently for each thread. But um, yeah, that's uh, how this is technically done. Is really technical. It's really really complicated. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, then let's move on uh, with the talk and have a look at the DRACE tool. So DRACE is a Dynamo Rio based um, race detection tool, which was written by me as, as, as my master thesis and which I now um, develop with a small student team at, at my group at Siemens. It's a binary instrumentation tool, so you don't have to modify the source code. Um, it uses uh, dynamic uh, um, instrumentation and we perform the so by, by that we do the all the analysis at runtime <clears throat> it runs on windows which is as far as i know apart from the intel inspector the only tool um, which runs on windows and does the start erase uh, analysis it has a fully extensible logic and um, that means you can even uh, implement it for your use use case or change it for your use case or just take the detector part of the the tool um pull it apart and just take the, the components you need, uh, which you cannot do with, with other tools. And um, it has a relatively low overhead between two times and like 40 times, which is really quite low for data race detection tools. It's based on reliable components. So for instrumenting, we use the Dynamo Rio framework. <clears throat> and for the race detection, we um, have uh, the threat sanitizer runtime backend. So that's just the, the part that is used for, for analyzing all the um, in, in, uh, for analyzing all the memory addresses we want to, to inspect. And we have an implementation for Fast Track 2, uh, which also just works as a, as a library. So you can even do even use it for something totally different where you're just in, uh, interested in, in, in an algorithm which can evaluate the happened before relation. Um, if you look at the layered architecture here, you see that we have the hardware platform. <clears throat> then we have the Dynamo Rio framework with the client attached, which is, is DRACE. To DRACE, we attach the uh, detector via an interface. And then we have uh, our binary which we want to analyze. And this binary can consist of native parts like C or C++ code and even .NET parts, which use a just-in-time compiler. And I do not want to go into too much detail here, but uh, I just want to show that the tool is really just event-driven. So we have mainly these uh, five events here. So we get notified when a thread is started, when a thread is finished. <clears throat> That's important for tracking the threads. Then when a module is loaded or unloaded, here a module refers to a shared library. So it can be a DLL on Windows or a shared object on Linux. <coughs> and uh, when the module is loaded, for instance, we can inspect which functions are in this module and so on. And then we have the basic block event, which just tells us that a new part of uh, so a new basic block, which is just some code fragment, is going to be executed. Then we can inspect that and um, add our instrumentation. Then it's compiled to the code cache, and then it's executed from there. And then if the next basic block is already on the code cache, um, we just natively execute it from there with uh, almost zero overhead because we don't have to instrument again. And if it's not there, then we have a fault in the code cache and we just start over with the basic block event. Here on the right, um, we have the 
uh, analysis logic with, which is decoupled via uh, an interface. So that's just the detector interface and the detector is just a C or C++ library. <clears throat> and also the detector just works on memory addresses. So it does not need information about symbols, things like that. And whenever the detector detects a data race um, just on the addresses, then it calls back into the D-Race logic, and here we collect the races and uh, symbolize them. So uh, here in D-Race, we then um, use the debugging information to get uh, from a given program counter, get um, the, the source code file and line and, and function where this uh, relates to. And I think that's it. So let's uh, move on to the demo. In the demo, we are going to analyze a uh, uh, yeah, not totally trivial <coughs> application. So it's a shopping rush simulation where you have uh, three stores, <coughs> a big store, a toy store, and a market. And in each of the stores, you have some parcels or, or products. And you have a horde of customers which want to buy these products. First, um, they enter the store and then they have some money and they try to grab packets or products as long as they have money and then they go to the, the counter and pay for that. And then um, in advance to the uh, to the money they spend, they get the, the packets and then the packets are not uh, not uh, in, the, in the store anymore. So how is this uh, model here? The, the customers are our threats. <clears throat> then they have an action which is just go wild. <clears throat> which um, is the logic where they enter the store and try to grab the products. And the store itself is just implemented, it's, it's really simplified, but it's just implemented as a um, standard multiset. So each product can be in the multiset multiple times. And whenever a, a customer grabs it from the multiset, it's removed from, from the set. So eventually the set is, is, will be empty at some point in time or the money is over. What happens first? And um, that's it. So the, the source code for, uh, for this demo is also available on GitHub. Um, I just have to move to the, to the demo so I can briefly show that to you. I hope you can now see my browser and um, here under GitHub Siemens D-Rays, <clears throat> that's the repository. We have this how-to and all things I am going to show to you um, are here explained in, in depth. So uh, if you want to redo that after the talk, feel free to just read through this tutorial here and and by that, you're able to do exactly <clears throat> the same what I'm going to, to do now here. So um, let's start with um, the, the DRAS distribution, uh, which you all uh, already uh, can download from GitHub. From there, you get um, this package here where you have a bin folder. And here in the bin folder, you have the, the DRAS GUI. I had to enlarge this the the um, fonts a bit to to make this work so sometimes things are not not perfectly aligned and here you're really guided through the process how to analyze a program with um with the the derace tool um here you have first have to select the um the path to your dynamo rio um just take the latest version of dynamo rio and insert the dr run here <clears throat> then we have the the um, detection tool which is not, not the detection tool, but the, the Dynamo Rio client, which is our DRACE tool. Then you can select some um, detection backends. Here we have the TSUN. Then we have, uh, um, so that's the threat sanitizer backend. Then we have a dummy implementation, which does no data race detection, but just does the instrumentation for mostly for debugging to see um, why things might crash. Um, then we have the fast track tool, which um, I'm going to use here. Then we have a configuration file for the DRAS tool. And now you can select the executable you want to analyze. And in this case here, we are going to ex analyze the um, shopping rush example. Uh, as you see here, we have lots of, of other examples. You can play around with them as well. And we also use them in the, uh, in the integration tests to see if uh, things are still going, going right. 
Um, so here we just select the shopping rush. <clears throat> then we can add some arguments for the application and we can al also add some DRAS flags. So here we are interested in uh, generating a report. We can exclude the stack if, if we like. Um, uh, and then, yeah, we, we can also run this in a, in a separate window. <clears throat> so here the GUI itself does not execute the, uh, the um, doesn't it's, it's not deras it's just a wrapper which then executes it but you can here you can click run in separate window then everything runs in a powershell and you can also just script it li like that but let's do it this way <clears throat> then for the report as we he are here on a different okay that's a bit tricky <laughs> as we are here on a different machine um, then where we compiled the um the examples, of course, the the passes to the to the source directories are not uh, not right, and because they point to the build machine and not to this machine here. So I just added the <coughs> source directory, and that's it. Then let's start it. Here first, the playground is set up. And there you already saw the first data race. <clears throat> and here you see Black Friday ended and DRAs found one possible data race. Let's wait for, for the um, symbolizing and report creation. And now um, the report is, is created. Then we can click here, open HTML report. And then hopefully the report opens up. Here you see um, the report. Then you can click uh, on the, the arrows to, to list list the arrows here. And here we just had one one um, issue, but it depends on, of course, on, on your, your program if you have multiple or just one. And here you see the call stacks for both the, the first access and the second access. So as I, as I said in the beginning, data race detection requires that you have two accesses to the same memory location and here, we just have the call stacks for both of these accesses. And then you can click on the elements here and um, see uh, a, a code preview for that. The black elements are um, elements where we don't have a uh, have code for that, like uh, the MSBC internals here. Um, we, we don't have them here, uh, but for the, 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 the green ones, uh, we have source code. And uh, if we click on them, then we just, see the source code um, was the uh, the line uh, of, of the, the call. So let's just skim through the call stacks. Um, here we have our uh, go, go wild. And um, well, there's not, not, not really an interesting things here. We just call our shopping function and then we go into the shopping function. And here we see um, the data race because here, we have an iterator and that points to the begin of the shop. And um, here we use the same iterator and we erase from the shop. And if you think of the consistency guarantees of C++ STL containers, you know that, that um, the shop.erase operation invalidates the iterator. So here, we advance an iterator, which is not valid anymore. And by that, we have the data race. And um, this might result in a crash. As I said, it might, <clears throat> because maybe the data race did not occur um, because they were executed in larger blocks. But even then, we were, we are able to detect this case. And uh, as you see here, already a unique lock is, uh, or a lock guard is used to protect it. But that's really a common common issue that the developers do not put the lock guards um, at the right <laughs> location. Because here, as, uh, um, of course, you have to move this lock guard up um, so that also um, this iterator here is, is protected or all, all accesses on, on, on the um, shop multi set are protected. And here, um, you can share these these reports with other developers as well because all the information, even the, the source code snippets are just uh, in uh, co copied to this HTML document. So that makes it really, really easy to uh, to then 
find the data races and finally solve them. And uh, just another word regarding solving data races um, and why it's important to have these call stacks, because as you see here, the data race happened in the here in the shopping and here in the tree wall rotate. But of course, that's not a location where you can fix it. So you have to fix it some somewhere um, in an in a upper part of the call stack, like maybe here. So that's why it's really important to have the whole call stack and not just the uh, location of the data rays. And now we can do this again. Why do I have two D rays GUIs open? OK, because I just started this two times. And just um, use the shopping rush solution here. And um, yeah, I would not create the, the report. Um, the, the rest can remain the same. Run it again <clears throat> and see if um, the, the a program is now race free. Also, the solution is on GitHub, so you can directly see how, how um, the problem is solved there. Let's wait for it to finish. And then you see this line found zero possible data races. So now, um, uh, Apparently, you fixed the problem. And what you can also do is to just click this button here, run in separate window. And that's more, uh, th that's really interesting for the heavy <coughs> users, or power users, because here um, you get a PowerShell and can do everything you want uh, with the DRAS tool and the PowerShell. You can even just copy the, it's a bit large here. <coughs> You can even just copy this command here to the clipboard and execute it uh, wherever you want. So um, it's not like you have to use the GUI. The GUI is just for you to to simplify how to use the tool and and how to um, set up this command here. Okay, um, I think that's it regarding the the demo. So let's move back to the presentation and. Um, discuss how this is this is done for or how this also could work for hybrid app, uh, applications because uh, in the beginning <clears throat> or in the title of the talk I said for managed and unmanaged applications this this works and for actually for this for managed applications so .NET for for instance <clears throat> the data race detection itself works exactly the same way so we instrument and we analyze and, and do all the, uh, all things uh, as we do. Um, we also instrument on the binary layer uniformly, independent of if it's uh, if it's jitted code or if it's native code. And um, in, in the master thesis, I also showed that the data races in managed code are actually physically detectable. So that means we, we are able to detect data races which happen in managed code in um, by, by just analyzing what the jitter generates. I mean, it's if you think about it, it's relatively clear that this <clears throat> this works. But uh, I was able to show it. Um, but here we have some challenges, and one is um, user level synchronization in the uh, in the jitter. That means if the jitter creates or uses a spin lock, which is then <laughs> jitted, and um, that has no call or things like that. So we, we have to be able to detect um, these user level synchronizations. Otherwise, we uh, create a lot of false positives. <clears throat> and then we have to uh, create a back pass <clears throat> so to get um, the symbols from the jitted code or get from, from the instruction pointer in the jitted code back to a source file in the C sharp code. And for that, uh, we use a trick because. Um, here we would need self-debugging, which uh, is not supported in our use case. So instead, we use a second process, which then attaches via the Windows debugging RP. There we have helper scripts. Um, that's the uh, SOS or Son of Strikes DLL. And um, with that, we can somehow communicate with the jitter or the .NET runtime and just ask it about um, where spin locks are and um, for a given instruction pointer to to get the the um, the symbol for for that if it's on on the heap <coughs> not on the heap it's uh, if it's in jitted code and um, by that with this uh, <laughs> technique here we are able to 
uh, to also analyze um, <clears throat> parts that are written in C sharp. But uh, here we we still this is still work in progress. So we have some limitations like <clears throat> the call stacks are a bit imprecise to inlining, and we have a very high overhead due to the double chitting and things like that. And and maybe we also have a lot of false positives, but that's something we are working on. But I just wanted to let you know um, that this is also something that is possible. And um, that's also why I wanted to keep that really brief. So if you are interested in that, then feel free to discuss about that in the, in the after session talk. <clears throat> and now we have a white slide. So I think we have time for questions. So there's one more question, which is also about clarification. So the tool detects an occurring race, not a potential race, right? Um, yes and no. So <laughs> technically, if you if you think of the the data race um, uh, as in, in the beginning, where you have these two counters, uh, where, where you have this one counter which is incremented by two threads, even if we have the schedule that first the the first thread um, loads increments and stores and then the second thread loads increment and stores. Then we are still able to detect the data race, even if it technically did not, at least not manifest, um, because the result was correct. And why can we do that? Yeah, because we just rely on the happened before relation. And for the happened before relation, the interleaving of the threads uh, during the execution doesn't matter. Only the uh, the event events and um, uh, and the relation itself is evaluated, but not the not not the um, the real real time or system time order. But um, why I say uh, yes and no, um, we are not able to detect data races which are in code paths which are not executed, because we only can analyze the code path that is executed. Yeah, and I hope that answered the question. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, cool then. Let's move on to a very important topic for <laughs> data race detection, and that is tuning because the overhead is huge otherwise. And here um, it's best to to break the whole process of doing the analysis into the, these four steps. So first, and even if it's done in a loop, we still have these four um, steps. So first, um, we do the instrumentation. That adds some overhead because um, we have more. One thing is the, the static overhead that it takes some time to add the instrumentation. And then we have also some runtime overhead because um, the instrumentation has to be executed. That are just more, more instructions that have to be executed. Um, then, we have overhead during the memory tracing because um, whenever a, a memory address is accessed and uh, we added instrumentation before that, then we have to duplicate this access because we have to um, write it to, to our buffer. So we just multiply the number of accesses by, num by number two. Um, then we have the buffer processing. That is the part that covers the analysis of the um, uh, of the gathered uh, addresses and doing some uh, some simple analysis like uh, sorting out the addresses which are on the stack which we might not be uh, interested in and, and uh, things like that. And finally, we have the race detection, which then evaluates the happened before relation for all these addresses, and that also takes time. And all these times here, uh, then the numbers are just just here to have some numbers, but um, all these overheads here are cum cumulative. So um, you have that they add, uh, add to each other. And um, one idea here is to reduce the overhead as early as possible. But of course, um, there are some drawbacks. And for instance, here uh, we add, we have a parameter to specify the instrumentation rate. And by that, we give the user the control to not instrument every instruction, but maybe just every second or every tenth or things like that, or just instrument parts of the program. But here the problem is that we make a systematic error because if we do not instrument uh, a memory access, then we will never see this memory access later on because it's just not 
not instrumented. <clears throat> so here we make, we introduce a systematic error. And also there are some things like calls to synchronization logic, which we cannot avoid because otherwise we just get lots of false positives. <clears throat> Then we have an adjustable sampling rate. And by that, <clears throat> I mean that we, from, from the end addresses, um, which are, yeah, so, so first we add the, instru uh, the, the instructions for the instrumentation. And then the, the instrumentation has, has a, um, a logic so that we can control if, if it is going to, write the, the following instruction to the buffer or just jump over it. And um, that's something which implements sampling because then we can say we are just in, uh, in, interested in every tense instruction. But here we do not make the systematic error because it's, if we just run the program long enough, we have a decent chance that we, uh, we see each instruction at least a couple of times. But of course, we still have the overhead of the instrumentation. Um, then we can, in the, in the buffer processing, we can sort out some um, addresses we are not interested in, like uh, stack addresses. And finally, uh, in the data rest detection, we cannot really do much, but we are working on, on that topic here to also drop state so that we do not have to uh, carry all addresses we ever saw, but just for maybe the, the last couple of, of seconds or just one gigabyte of memory or things like that. <clears throat> and the general idea here is to analyze only the interesting parts and to avoid the overhead as early as possible. But of course, as I said, we have to differentiate between mandatory events that are events we have to detect, otherwise our results are just wrong and we get lots of false positives and optional events that are events um, why we do not introduce false positives even if we don't get them. And here um, we can apply fine-grained tuning and here an uh, important question is, um, that's a more fundamental question, what is frequent? So here <clears throat> we can say we, we use the, the address of the instruction and maybe use a, a hash map and just count how often we see this address of the instruction. And I say, whenever, whenever our instruction is executed a mul uh, multiple times, then at some point it's, it's uh, becoming frequent. Or we can say here, the, the operands, so the target memory address um, is something we want to, to use for our uh, frequent uh, leveling. But here the problem is that the address of the instruction, that is something that is known in advance. So we can, we, we can detect if that is executed multiple times with almost zero overhead or a very, a very, very little overhead. But here the operands are only known at, compile, at, at runtime. So, so when, when they, are, they are executed. So here it's really hard to, um, to use this metric here for uh, for for collecting the the frequency of of uh, how we of, how often we um, access the target address, because just to detect that we have to we have to read the address, and um, if we have to do that, then it's not not really a good metric because we added the overhead anyway, so um, we could also use that for 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 the memory tracing and for for the analysis later on. So instead we go for, for these uh, addresses of the instruction. And here an uh, important question is how to exclude frequent blocks. And one option here to do that is to use uh, a Loxy counting model. That's um, a technique that's often used in stream processing to just count the most frequent, uh, most frequent uh, items in a stream without having to keep the whole stream. And um, the, the, we can also um, deal with something like concept drift so that not always the same event is, is frequent, but over time this might change. And, and we can use the lossy counting, uh, counting model here for, um, for that. And then we can either remove the instrumentation, <clears throat> but that means that we will never see addresses uh, which are part of, of this code block anymore, or we can just deactivate the instrumentation. And then after some time, it's, it's not frequent anymore. And then uh, we can re-add the instrumentation. And um, you might think of if 
all that is really a good idea because um, we want to detect data races, so we need the memory addresses. Why does it help to just consider some of them? And here is, uh, we have theory behind that, that it's still useful to do sampling because for, especially for the industry applications, um, they are often services. So you have a, a startup logic in the application and then um, we have some steady state which is executed over and over and over again. And then we have some shutdown logic. And data races in the startup and in the shutdown logic are not too important um, because yeah, either the, 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 the service crashes in the beginning or it doesn't crash. Um, but what we are really interested in is the data races in the, in the middle part, so in the, uh, in the steady state. And here, the same things are executed over and over again. And you can just um, consider that for a data race um, that consists of two accesses, we need to detect the data race, we need to detect both addresses in the same epoch. So that means in, if you consider a loop, maybe in the, in the, the same uh, loop or just between two synchronizations. And um, you can do some statistics and then you see um, that if you have a, a chance for a data race that it uh, of um, 10 minus the power of four, <clears throat> so that's just um, the, the chance that the current instruction is a data race, or you can think of that, um, maybe that's, that makes things more clear, that um, uh, in a 10 to the power of four instructions, we have one data race. Um, and then if you sample like, and, and just consider every 100th instruction, then if you run the program for like um, 10 million rounds or 10 million instructions, <clears throat> then you still have a, a probability of 40% to detect the data race. And if you run the program even longer, then uh, the, property, uh, the probability to detect the data race is almost 100%. Of course, in, in practice, there are some things that might uh, make pro the probabilities a bit lower here. Like uh, if you have lots of synchronization, then it might be hard to detect really um, the data races in the same epoch. But it's, I, I mean, we did uh, we did some, some uh, analysis on, on real world applications and also there we were able to detect uh, and to confirm that it really works to, to sample. Um, and by the way, it really helps to reduce the overhead. And by that, you are able to analyze applications, um, which otherwise you wouldn't be able to analyze. Okay, um, let's move on to the, to the um, evaluation. So here in this case, we evaluated the DRACE tool on the 7-SIP application and um, just looked at the, uh, how, how effective is sampling. <clears throat> and what I did there is that I um, introduced a data race by removing, or I introduced multiple data races by removing five critical sections. So, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, in the in the demo, here you have to distinguish between the cause of a data race, which is a missing synchronization, and a data race. So, one cause of a data race might result in a lot of data races, but you just have to fix it once, so you just have to fix the cause. So here I introduced five causes <clears throat> by removing these five critical sections and then run the tool um, while it's extracting boost or things like that. And um, then I uh, just tried it with multiple sampling periods. <clears throat> here you see if we uh, do not sample at all. So if you, uh, if we um, just consider each memory access, we detect a bit more than 30 data races. And here the bottom graph detects um, uh, or shows if we detect all causes or how many causes we are able to detect. And here we detect the five causes. And um, as long as we uh, do not sample more, uh, less than two to the power of five, um, so each two to the power of five and fifth instruction, uh, we were able to detect all the causes here. 
And of course, if we sample more and more at some point in time, we will not be able to detect data races anymore. So then the analysis is useless. But if you look at the, the overhead here, we started with an overhead of maybe um, factor 1.9. And with sampling, we were able to reduce <clears throat> this overhead to a factor of 1.6. So as the example here is, it's not really um, memory bound, but it's more like I/O bound because it's uh, the the extraction requires reading uh, this, um, data from the disk. <clears throat> the overhead is relatively low here. But uh, in the next example, I'll show another example, which is um, computer memory bound, and there you will see the same. <clears throat> Here, the the this marker shows um, what's, uh, what's the, the the highest sampling period we could use to still detect all the data races. And what you also see is that. Um, the instrumentation overhead remains almost constant here, um, but the detection overhead uh, is reduced because here um, we uh, just have to analyze less memory addresses, but the instru ins uh, instrumentation is always the same. <clears throat> so let's move on to another example. That's the POF ray, um, ray tracer. And the, for, for our benchmarking here, we just let the POF ray ray tracer ray trace this uh, picture here on the left. And there we had an overhead between um, 10 times and 35 times. There we did exactly the same. And as you can see here, um, with this technique of sampling, we were able to really, really reduce the um, the, the number of data races, so, uh, not the number of data races, but uh, the overhead. So here we started with an overhead of like 35. If we just took every second instruction, we had an even higher overhead. This comes from the fact that uh, we need a different um, logic to toggle between um, the on and the off state of the instrumentation. So here we have to add more instructions um, in the instrumentation part, and by that we get a higher overhead. But um, if we uh, use more and more or longer and longer sampling periods, this um, overhead uh, pays off. And then uh, here we converge toward our overhead of factor of 10. And that's it. So um, before we have time for questions, let me first briefly conclude. So what, what did we um, learn in the talk? We learned things about race detection, that we need to collect memory addresses, synchronization events, and function calls. Um, for C -sharp, we um, with all these techniques, we are also able to analyze jitted code. Then for the instrumentation parts, um, we learned what is instrumentation, um, how to add in add monitor instrument uh, instru how to add monitoring instructions, <laughs> how that can be done at uh, compile time and at runtime. And at runtime, we uh, had an in-depth look in how this is uh, done on the fly. And finally, uh, I showed some performance uh, tuning techniques. Um, so um, how we can reduce the, the overhead by just analyzing the interesting parts, by trying to avoid the overhead as early as it happens, and how to use sampling for a trade-off between the runtime overhead and the detection quality. So if you are interested in uh, uh, convincing you by your own that uh, this is not just paperwork, what I did here, then I would be happy to, uh, if you have a look at the D-Race, um, that's an open source project. And that's on GitHub. If you like the project, uh, give us a star. As always with open source project, that really helps the project. Uh, if you are interested even more into uh, into the background of the tool and into the nitty and uh, nitty details, then um, also you can check out this um, uh, publication, which is my master thesis. Um, it's like a year old, but it's still <laughs> still valid. And um, we are actively working on the tool. So um, one construction site is uh, to to use the JIT itself to instrument the managed code so that we can avoid this double JITting. Then we are working on optimizing the fast track two algorithm for highly concurrent applications with maybe 100 threads or so. And um, that's a pretty cool thing we are currently working on is to write uh, a data race detection tool for Python. 
And as DRAIS, as I said, DRAIS is modular. So you can just take the, the fast track, for instance, and we have Python, or we are working on Python bindings for the fast track race detection um, or race uh, detector. And then just uh, write some front end for Python, which gathers you all the information you need, like memory accesses and calls and synchronization, and just uh, uses the fast track um, detector to then perform data race detection in Python. And um, that's it. So uh, I think there are a lot of questions uh, about this topic. And um, maybe we have time for some questions right in this session. And after that, I would be happy to see you again in the, the virtual Hangout um, session <clears throat> that's going to happen on Zoom. Here's the meeting ID and, and also the password. So uh, thanks for for listening, and I would be really really happy if you if you could, uh, yeah, if you try your, the tool or if you um, just uh, report back how it helped you and and things like that. So then, first of all, thanks a lot for the talk. There was also a lot of uh, positive feedback in the chat already. There's one more question that I think uh, fits pretty well to the summary. Uh, which types of applications or algorithms have a lot of problems with data races? I've never experienced data race problems myself. So in um, the, how, how to put it. So the most important thing is to have a clean software architecture to avoid data races in the first place. And it's not the right strategy to rely on data race detection tools to, to just fix the things you messed up in the first place. And um, that that almost always answers this question here. So that are, that are applications which do not have a clear software architecture. And by that, I also mean a clear understanding of ownership. And as the, uh, this is a C++ uh, user group here, I think you are pretty familiar with what ownership means. And um, if you think about how this is done in Rust, for instance. In Rust, you have a clear ownership, uh, ownership model, which ensures that data race cannot be happen or can be detected at compile time. And that's that's also the um, the type of application um, which suffer from these data races that are applications which have grown over time. And in, in our case, that are mostly applications which are written for, for, for a single threaded execution model. And then, um, as the, the, the so-called power wall was hit and um, you did not get faster and faster uh, execution speed just by buying new CPU hardware, it had to be paralyzed. And then paralyzing an application what, uh, which was never written with this multi-threading um, concepts or problems in mind uh, is, is a really, really tough job. And that's where we use these tools to um, to detect data races, which we otherwise wouldn't be able to detect. <laughs>